You might be surprised to learn that female circumcision of minors used to be performed in hospitals in the United States of America. Female circumcision was legal to perform in the U.S. before 1996, only 14 years ago, and was covered by Blue Cross Shield, the largest medical insurance company in the U.S., until 1977. In other words, female circumcision was not only legal, but was insured and often performed right here in the U.S., even after most of you were born. Now, I'm not talking about Muslims here. I'm talking about middle and upper class, Caucasian, mostly Christian, American families getting their little girls circumcised, often by the request of their pediatricians. It all started in the Victorian era, not long after some doctors of the era began promoting male circumcision. Many of them began to justify female circumcision using the same rationales. To deter masturbation, treat nervousness or hysteria, epilepsy, neurasthenia, and for general health. Claims that female circumcision could protect against disease and prevent smegma buildup were fairly common in the medical literature on through the 1960s. Even the well-known physician and inventor of the cornflake, Dr. Harvey Kellogg, jumped on the bandwagon to promote female circumcision. In his book, Plain Facts for Young and Old, Embracing the Natural History of Hygiene and Organic Life, Kellogg wrote, the object, female circumcision, is the same as that of circumcision in the male. In females, speaking of female masturbation, an application of pure carbolic acid to the clitoris is an excellent means of allaying the abnormal excitement. While not as common in the UK, the London obstetrician Isaac Baker Brown performed many clitorectomies on women and young girls in the late 19th century. There are no reports of medicalized female circumcision in the UK after Brown. However, not the same can be said for America. While British doctors now frowned upon Brown's ideas, American doctors asked, what now will be the chance for recovery for the poor epileptic female with a clitoris? I'm now going to further go through some papers published in respectable medical journals to give you a better perspective of some highly respected views on female circumcision in America, starting with Robert Morris's paper entitled, Is Evolution Trying to Do Away with the Clitoris? Published in the journal, American Association of OBGYNs in 1892. Prepucial adhesions in women are similar in character to those which occur less frequently in men, and the resulting disturbances are alike in both sexes but greater in degree in women because of the more impressionable nervous system of that sex. The clitoris is to disappear as civilization advances. The irritation of prepucial adhesions early attacks the attention of the child to that part, which is frequently rubbed to give relief, until the habit often becomes a fixed one, innocently on her part, as the girl grows older and neurasthenia results. After collecting enough cases for statistical purposes, I dropped the subject, as it is naturally repelling to one of the opposite sex. But the proper persons must at once take up this work of looking after adherent prepuces in young girls. The fast-growing girl with prepucial adhesions may become languid enough to sag into scoliosis, and no amount of orthopedic treatment will stop the scoliosis, which is but a symptom in her case. The young asthmatic, the girl whose uterus is antiflexed, the child who is listless and fretful and fanciful as to her food, the patient with aneurysis or dysuria and with menstrual irregularities, the hysteric, the patient with epileptoid convulsions, the patient with nervous dyspepsia or spasmodic stricture of the esophagus, or non-inflammatory paralysis of the legs. All of these must be examined by the diagnostician for prepucial adhesions. I do not wish to be understood as underrating the importance of any other well-known cause for the same symptoms. Errors of refraction perhaps standing first in causal relation for many of them, but would simply state that prepucial adhesions are the prime factor in a sufficient proportion of these cases to at least make it necessary for us to eliminate that factor wherever it is found. Chronic local irritation may be stopped and some unresponsive wives find that the clitoris was at fault. The proper time for the separation of prepucial adhesions is when the baby is first born and as a matter of routine practice. Baker Brown, I believe, was very near to the subject of prepucial adhesions when he published his work on the curability of various forms of insanity, epilepsy, catalepsy, and hysteria. 
One of my patients who suffered from epileptoid seizures with several attacks weekly, stimulating grand mal, is reported by the family physician as having had no attacks for a year since circumcision was performed on her. Very many neurasthenic girls made prompt and striking improvement as a result of the same treatment. In a word, I may say that separation of prepucial adhesions in girls accomplishes just what it does in boys. I now advocate the removal of the prepuce instead of simply separating it from the glands. In July of 1898, in the Journal of Orificial Surgery, Scott McFarland, in his paper, Circumcision of Girls, wrote, Every few moments she would grind her teeth, of which she had her full complement, squint her eyes, straighten out and utter a cry, unlike the familiar one of an epileptic. Parents had taken her to every doctor in town, as well as before the Missouri State Medical Society, where after careful examination, they pronounced her about hopeless, but advised to do nothing, and that at maturity she would probably improve. The parents were not satisfied, as that was the advice given to them with an older child, and it died at two and one half, with symptoms identical to this one. I had the child stripped, and immediately saw the body was covered with hair, as completely as if she were a fully developed woman instead of a two-year-old child. Knowing such a growth of hair came at puberty, and puberty meant an activity of the sexual system. I examined the clitoris, or where it ought to have been, but it was so neatly sealed in by a hypertrophied hood that I could not find a trace of it. We immediately administered chloroform and began to unearth the most completely bound down clitoris I had ever seen. The hood, where it was amputated, was just one half inch in thickness. From that day, the child began to improve. And now, 15 months later, with no medicine whatsoever, save possibly zinc phosphate and passiflora, she can walk, talk some, sleeps and eats well, eyes nearly straight, but little grinding of her teeth. Is still very nervous, but infinitely improved. And according to her mother's statement of May 19th, she is getting better, stronger in every way, improving every day. Some of the blind doctors have opened their eyes and are anxious to know what has brought about such a change. Only the circumcision of a girl, and as many little girls would be benefited by such treatment as boys, and I for one have circumcised as many girls as boys, and always with happy results. In June of 1915, published in the American Journal of Clinical Medicine, Benjamin E. Dawson, a doctor from Kansas City, Missouri, wrote, Circumcision in the female, its necessity and how to perform it. Disastrous reflexes and nervous disturbances, often caused by the clitoris, boldly amputated the offending organ with excellent results in some cases. A large number of physicians fail to realize the importance of the proper condition of the foreskin in the male, that in order to avoid the dangers of convulsions, eczema, paralysis, constipation, tuberculosis, locomotor ataxia, rheumatism, idiocy, insanity, lust, and all its consequences, the prepuce must be completely loosened, if too long, amputated, if too tight, split open. A much larger number of physicians are seemingly ignorant of the fact that females have an organ anatomically corresponding to the penis in the male. Each produces a cheesy substance which hardens under an adherent prepuce. The same category of diseases, having had their origin in nerve waste caused by pathological foreskin in the male, may be duplicated in the female from practically the same cause and in addition other diseases peculiar to females. Chorea, chlorosis, hysteria, and various nervous disturbances nearly always have their origin in the faulty condition of the hood of the clitoris. Reflexes travel along the line of least resistance. Irritation in the sexual organs, therefore, may reach the mental or moral faculties, resulting in imbecile, sexual perversion, or moral degeneracy. Many neurosis and even psychosis have their origin in pathological conditions of the hood of the clitoris. The girls have been sadly neglected. Therefore, I make a plea on their behalf. I feel an impulse to cry out against the shameful neglect of the clitoris and hood. Some two months ago, a child two and a half years old was brought to me from Ottawa, Kansas. It presented a bad case of marasmus, malnutrition and anemia. There was little development, the lower limbs hanging almost as useless as strings. The child made no effort at vocal articulation. The clitoris was completely snowed under with an adherent hood. The adhesions were broken up and circumcision performed. 